we're going to talk about uh, something that, that uh, I would say just very recently uh, in, the Lord was speaking to my heart on, and, um, and I just found it really interesting because uh, even though he was only talking to me uh, about it in my heart uh, just in the last couple of days where he started Monday, uh, it, was, it was over the last little while that he kind of took me back through to see, you know? So um, almost like you're, you, you went through a, a season or a, a, a time, and then he kind of starts talking to you about that time, right? Or just in your heart. And what, <clears throat> what are the, the things? Uh, I want to show you a picture. Uh, tonight. Um, I'm actually going to text you. Uh, I'm not going to even text you the other picture, but I want, I want you to see this picture here. Um, this right here, you might not understand what this is. Uh, this is a little bit of history. Uh, this is the claimed territory of Texas. This is back before the Civil War. This is back when the United States of America uh, wasn't so united. Uh, it was colonies, and it was states, and it was uh, you had slavery, and you had uh, northern territories that didn't want slavery. Uh, and then you had southern territories, uh, especially because of the crops, certain crops uh, you could really benefit from if you had slaves. But when you got further north and like northern Missouri, it wasn't really that great because it didn't grow cotton. It didn't grow some of these things that you really needed a lot of labor for. It's great for cattle, but you couldn't, they couldn't export cattle without railways and all this kind of stuff. So, so there was this great divide in our country. Some of us remember that the Civil War happened, which isn't too long ago. You know, I mean, we're talking just 150 years ago. We're talking great-grandpa. I mean, if you had a great-great-grandpa, he would be in that era, in a sense, born in that as a child. So it's kind of crazy just to think where we've come. But I want you to see this picture, and we're going to talk about um, uh, something that, that uh, maybe when you look at the United States of America, everybody here can probably close their eyes and picture the map of the United States of America. And if you were to think about, um, let's just look at like the, the bottom uh, border of Oklahoma, there's these, this blue line. What is that blue line? Anybody know what, what, what is, creates the bottom border of Oklahoma? Huh? The Red River. The Red River. The Red River. That's pretty good. How about, uh, how about some of these, uh, these, the east side, the east side of, let's say, a lot of Arkansas and Missouri. Anybody know what forms that border? The Mississippi River. Yeah, it's kind of kind of crazy how there's these rivers. How about um, what is it that forms? Which right now this is an overlay of earlier uh, borders in a sense, uh, but you can see in the white lines uh, of uh, of the states. What is it that forms the the line of uh, Colorado? Do you see Colorado right there? You know, like it's that straight line. Or, or Kansas. What's, what's Kansas? If you, if you look at where Oklahoma is at, right above where it says the Arkansas River, right, right, what's the west border? What, what is that created? How, how did they create that? Huh? Somebody? Say, somebody made a line? It's just a state line. How, how do they establish a state line? Is there like a gorge there? or Like... It's interesting if you look back and they said, okay, on this line, on this parallel, we're going to establish, which, I mean, back then it was like, okay, the river or the gorge, you know, but like square. Colorado, mountains. We're going to just put a square there. It just doesn't make sense, right? But uh, anyway, I got to, got to uh, uh, thinking about uh, just borders and how uh, this is what the Lord had spoke to my heart when I was driving. Um, borders are, uh, are established or uh, rearranged uh, in war. Borders are established or rearranged in war. Uh, how many of you have followed just this, just in our lifetime, Israel and in the news and how things are? Uh, you might give up this land, or maybe they won back and they say they have the borders of the this nineteen well, it was nineteen forty six or nineteen seventy six war. Is it when was the how many out? 67, that's right, 1967 war. And so they have these borders and there's certain lands that they've kept. And, and so they say, well, that's really not their land. That's just what they took back in, the, in that war. Or there's just all kinds of different places of, that war does truly reestablish borders. Okay? So now, borders, um, borders are significant. Borders, for you and I, uh, we're going to talk tonight about, uh, about borders uh, that you and I can occupy 
um, or you and I can, uh, in a sense, not be able to, to occupy because of spiritual battles. So when you and I go through a spiritual battle, we are either going to stand and occupy and, in, ex- in a sense, expand our borders, right, to where we would hold the fullness of the promises of God. Can I give you, uh, give you the borders of God are the promises of God. The borders that are you and I are to occupy are the promises of God. They're words. The same way that God introduced the, the promised land, he s- declared borders of the promised land with his words, it'll be over here, it'll be over here, it'll be over here. There, are, there is a kingdom of heaven here on this earth that it was established through the words of God, his great, exceeding great and precious promises given to you and me for this life here and now. And the war is against what has been, can I say this again, has been given to you. It has been given to me. And so uh, how you and I fight determines whether or not we're going to occupy and hold that space or whether or not we're going to have to fight again to, 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 to take that space, to take that space back. How many of you know like there are some things and some promises of God that maybe you just, you got to, you got to, you kind of just, you have a shop set up on that promise. You know what I mean? Like you're, you got a, a town built, a city built. I mean, you're in and out of that promise all the time. In a sense, that border, like that is, you got houses there and you got land. I mean, that is your place. But there might be some other promises of God where um, you, you tried to take that land, but you didn't maybe take it like it, it didn't go easy. And so when something raised up, it was like giant there and you got your tail whooped. And, and so you don't want to really go back, maybe. And that maybe is a place of, of something that you, avo- you and I avoid. Uh, and so we're just going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about fighting the fight of faith. We're going to talk about occupying the places that God has given us and really how to do that um, uh, tonight. But just how significant it is. If you'll put that picture back up there, I want to just give you a, just a little history uh, of what happened. And we're going to talk about what it causes us to uh, not occupy the borders or the promise. We can look at the children of Israel. We're going to do that just for just a little bit tonight. But there are a couple of things, and the two things I want to really hit on, that cause you and I to have our borders recede. And there's two things we're going to talk about tonight, and that is our complaining that brings us into unbelief. You'll find that the children of Israel... um, uh, they didn't enter in, they wandered in the land, uh, but really they didn't get to enter in when they came back with an evil report of unbelief. It wasn't their complaining, but their complaining did lead them to unbelief. When you and I complain, it will lead us to unbelief. And that right there is what, in a sense, keeps us from occupying the places God has given us to exist or to be or to live from. Complaining will move us to a place of unbelief. Complaining is an expression uh, is an expression of us looking at two things, more than just like we 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 want this, but we're looking at it, it's doubt expressed. So complaining is truly our doubts expressed. Anyway, so we got complaining, and the other one is compromise. Compromise. Compromise will keep you and I out. There's a story in, in Joshua chapter seven. Uh, the, the story of, of when they were supposed to go into Ai and take the city, but uh, there were some things reserved for the Lord, uh, and they were not to be taken by the children of Israel, but they compromised, and they thought, you know, I could have a little of this, you know, I could have a little of that, and compromise uh, can change your borders. How many of you know when you are called and God called you to rule, and let's not talk about borders more than just promise, let's talk about borders in line and uh, maybe in the understanding of what God has given you to, uh, for your family or for your dest- a destiny, a gift, a calling, a design for your life, for you to lead and live in, the, in such a way, compromise can keep you from living in the place that God ordained you to stand. Compromise. You're to be this, maybe you're to be this business leader, and according to the Lord, a business leader that's to have this influence uh, financially and, and so on and so forth, but your compromise to see the secretary uh, now cause division in a family, and now that division in the family has you divided trying to take care of family issues instead of uh, 
pouring your heart and, and soul into business and family that's whole, and now you're playing child support, divided, all of these kind of stuff. The business, you can't grow the way because it's, it's constantly fought over. And so because of compromise, the place that you were to stand, the borders uh, have been just completely torn down, and now you're just a shadow of where you should be. Compromise. So this is why I want to show this picture up here, <clears throat> because this right here, uh, this right here is the, the lands of Texas, the claimed territory. But how many know the claimed territory of Texas is the green, right? Um, but that's not all of Texas, is it? Mm -mm. No. Um, do you know what happened uh, where there's this line on the 36th parallel? Do you know what happened? Does anybody know what happened on the line of the 36th parallel? And Texas lost all of its land north of the 36th par parallel. Anybody know? No? Okay. Well, here's what happened in, 18, in the early 1800s. There's something called the Missouri Compromise. The Missouri Compromise was something that was established before uh, Texas decided to join the, the, uh, the uh, come into the state and become a state. Um, they wanted to come into the state as a slave state. However, the Missouri Compromise said this, that any land north of the 36th parallel could not have slaves. So in order, in order for them to join the nation as a state and have its own rules and have its own independence, in a sense, establish its own state bird, you know, the good stuff, right? You know, all those kind of things, right? Uh, it's interesting how we're at 50, nation, or 50 states and everyone's like, I got a state tree, I got a state flower, I got a state. Like everyone, they got their own individualism, right? Um, <clears throat> but in order to do that, they had to give up some of their territory. So no longer could they occupy any of that land. That land could not be, could not be theirs. They actually had to give that up. And that was years after uh, the, the, they had already been established. This is like 40, 50, 60 years. I don't know the exact date when, when they came into the, into the union or into the, as a state. But they, they knew that, like the government ruled that said, hey, if you're going to come a part, of our, a part of the states, because of this treaty, the Missouri Compromise, you can't have that land. And they're like, okay, we still want to have slaves. And then not too long after that, the Civil War and the Emancip Emancipation of Proclamation, which is where the free, freeing of all slaves. And so they lost, they lost out because of compromise. And so from that compromise, when they came back and they established Kansas as a state, and they, they did that at the 37th parallel. Okay, So that, that would be where the top line of the Oklahoma panhandle. So the story of the Oklahoma panhandle is this. Compromise, the Missouri Compromise established a line. Texas gave up their land through compromise. And then there was a, this, a, this line that was set through through Kansas, Colorado, all that, that, that line to the north there. And so there was a section that, which we now know as the Oklahoma panhandle, which was no man's land or given for people to go squat on. If you could keep it, you could keep it. And eventually, it became part of Oklahoma. It was the Cimarron Territory for a little while, and then it got adopted into Oklahoma. So that's why Oklahoma has a panhandle, because, well, Texas compromised. It's an interesting little study, right? I don't know. It's just kind of interesting, borders, how borders are set. Borders are set because compromise. I wonder what borders are in my life right now because of compromise. I mean, that, that's a good question to ask ourselves, isn't it? Yeah. Wonder what borders. You know, there's a scripture that talks about to get your tent pegs, tighten up the cords, stretch them out, because God wants to expand the borders. You know, you can look in the very beginning of Genesis. He said, he said I'm giving you, now give me this land, subdue it, conquer it. He, want, he, he, he wanted the people of God. He wanted, God wants his ways to, to be all over this earth. Let me say it this way. God would like the borders that you and I occupy to be larger. He would like the influence of the church to be greater than it is. He would like you to not be limited in any way, but you would have access to greater, greater things. But those uh, things, your access to those things that the Lord has given to you and me, they are only afforded when you and I occupy until he comes. I was uh, having, having had the Lord begin to talk to me about these things. I was sitting at a table. I was just up in Branson for uh, uh, just a day and a half uh, at a uh, uh, Rama Ministerial Alliance 
uh, conference. So basically, it's just a group of pastors, all the pastors in uh, northwest Arkansas, all of Arkansas, Oklahoma, some part of Missouri, and they, they, they get graduated from Bible school, and they get together um, and are strengthened in the sense of teaching the Word and so on and so forth. And there's some b- small breakout sessions and then some more teaching and things like that. So great, awesome time. And I uh, got to go up there. Well, in one of the breakout sessions, there was this gentleman and uh, I was sitting at the table with him, and it, we, we were talking, and, uh, and he asked me a question about if there's much spiritual warfare uh, in, in your area. You're like, I don't know how we got on this talking about spiritual warfare. And, um, and I thought that was interesting because I, the Lord had been talking to me about that. And I said, you know what? Um, you really recognize it if you're not vigilant in prayer. Like you, you, you realize that there's a, things, a lot of things become harder when you and I stop taking our place in prayer. There are, in a sense, things move in. But different things are allowed to now rule and reign because you're not. So we're, we're kind of talking like about what we're talking about in borders. It's kind of like a little bit about our homes, right? It's a little bit about our homes. It's a little like it's a kind of like whole family-ish a little bit, uh, but it's it's also about like. Your everything. It's about the church. It's about your business. It's about, uh, it's, a, it's about your mind. It's about so many things that the Lord has given to you and me, but the enemy would love to come in and steal some things. He'd love to come in and he'd like to come and cross some borders. He'd love, or love to come in and, and, uh, and take what belongs to you and me because we're not watchful, because we're, not, we're unaware. And sometimes when we're busy, we can become unaware. And when we're busy and we become unaware, the enemy can get in and, and in a sense, take some ground uh, from us that he doesn't, he doesn't own. And you can have it back. You just got to take your authority back. You're just going to have to occupy that land. So, uh, so anyway, so let's go to a few scriptures here uh, tonight. Um, uh, I'm not, we're not going to, we're not going to, I'm just going to give you some scriptures and I'm not going to take time to read uh, some of these um, and then we'll get to more of the meat of it. So Genesis 15, 18, you see that uh, the Lord establishes uh, borders of a promised land, okay? Uh, so the Lord does some things and he establishes things from the beginning. Like when the Lord, uh, when the Lord, when salvation happened, when Jesus came and paid a price, there was some things that happened at the cross when Jesus finished his work and the Lord declared that to be the borders, the boundaries that are yours and mine, no matter where you stand today. There are some things that, that that's where it was set. Here in Genesis 15, the Lord declares to Abraham these borders, whether or not the children of Israel lived in them for a season or went into Babylon because of disobedience and following other gods and compromise or whatever it might be, it doesn't change what God promised the children of Israel. Even today, they may not be operating in all of these borders, but that doesn't change what God is going to give them. Okay, So I'm just establishing here that God starts things First, like, and he doesn't change his mind. Like, oh, you know what? That healing, and and you know that that pr- that promise of peace, and oh, you know that, you know, you know that's kind of a tough one. I didn't realize they were going to have all these new like d- diseases that were manufactured, and man's pretty good at stuff. And you know, let's just pull that one back a little bit. We're going to rein those borders in, and and we're not going to promise man, you know, this many years to live. Because uh, that's a lot. So let's just scale it back. You know what? Maybe, what do you think? Five or ten years? Do you think, Joe, that would be okay? Maybe five or ten? Compromise? Five? Ten? What do you, what do you, seven. Seven. We'll go with seven. Yeah, seven. Seven and a half. Okay. Seven and a half less years uh, to, to your life. That's what you can have. That's what you can, you can believe God for. I can believe God. I don't understand how we can believe God at this level. He says this, but I'll be willing to believe him here. Like, like what makes up in our mind that, that, that I, can, I can agree with God up to what? It, it's not even reasonable anyway. So like how can I? It, anyway. So compromise will keep you and I not only, not, only keep, not only shrink our borders, but what we see from compromise, it actually keeps us out. Okay. 
uh, it actually keeps us out. But anyway, so he establishes this, these borders from the beginning. And just hang with me tonight. I'm, I'm, it's, it's maybe kind of a little a different message because it really comes from just a conversation with the, with the Lord and me bouncing some things back back and forth. And, um, and so then we see like in, in, in Numbers chapter 11, we see uh, really, really a lot of times before that, but you see the children of Israel get delivered from Egypt. And then after they're delivered from Egypt, they're wanting to go back where there's fish and uh, they're complaining about it's cold out, it's hot out. It's all, I mean, like it's all of the things. And that complaint leads them into Numbers chapter 13, uh, where, again, all of this, there's a lot of time or there's a span of a lot of things that happen. And now there's spies sent out to go into a land and they come back with an evil report. Okay? So that's where we get. So com- it's interesting. Complain, 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 complain. The Lord's getting fed up. The Lord's like, all right, here's some quail. All right, here's some manna. They're like, oh, well, I don't, just complain, right? And yet, and so they've seen God move, but yet um, it doesn't matter how many times you and I see God move if complaining is a part of our, our world. You, you, you start complaining about this and complaining about this, God will come through and he'll deliver you. He'll make that payment here and he'll set your kid free from that, that there. But complaining's a part of your... So what you and I consider is all that God is not. All that he can't... Like we're considering all... We're not considering God in any of it. Our reasoning is not at all like what God can do. All right? It, c- complaining. Last night we watched a movie. Um, it was called The Hill. Anybody ever seen the movie called The Hill? Anyway, it's about this little this uh, Ricky Hill. He's a baseball player. He became a baseball player, but he was born with uh, braces, right? And he couldn't walk or run and all that kind of stuff. And he defied odds, defied odds, defied odds. And he became this uh, professional baseball player. That's the story of the movie. But the whole time I'm watching this movie, his dad is a pastor. And his dad don't, won't let him play baseball. Never came to his game all through his high school. Never, never, never wanted him to play. And the whole time, he's telling them all that he can't do. And I'm thinking, the whole time I'm thinking, okay, somebody pray for him. I'm, the whole time in the movie, I'm like, somebody like, pray for this kid. Like, that's what's going to happen. Like, how he's going to get his healing. He's gonna, like, someone is going to pray for this kid. And like, th- th- there's going to be a miracle. Like, so it's like right there, he's in the church all the time. You know, like, what's going on? But the, the, the people are destroyed because they don't know what's, what, what is, what is, what's his. You know? So I'm like, it's just frustrating the whole time. I'm thinking, just this is a, po- this is a possibility. This is available. If you don't know what's available, you'll never, you'll never fight for it. If you don't know what's given to yours, you'll, you'll, never, you'll never fight for it. But when, it, when you know what's given to you, you'll fight for it. Did you know that one of the promises uh, that you could have for your children, uh, he said that, that their peace would be great, they'd have undisturbed composure, that in your house you could have just your house and your children could be full of peace, not just with family, not like this with mom and dad. You can have, you can say, you can fight for that. Because these are promises. Okay? Again, there's promises. And why, this is why promises, when you read the word and you see promises, man, you got to get a color in your Bible, highlighter of like, I don't know what color that you don't use. And it's the promise color. Right? The blood color. I don't know. And you, every time you open that Bible, you can just start going through and going, oh, look at all those colors. Oh, look at that one. Oh, look at that one. Oh, yeah. We got some promises. And these promises are borders that are, are, that are given to us to occupy from. And if the enemy's in there, we can take authority over him with the word of God, the, use the sword and get him right back out. Okay? So anyway. Um, anyway, so we, we see in Numbers uh, 13 where, where uh, the, the unbelief... Um, and the complaint led to unbelief and the evil report, and, uh, and that kept the children of Israel out. We saw in Joshua chapter 7 and 8 the story of Ai, uh, and, and how, even this, I think it's so cool, in Joshua uh, chapter 8, how the Lord re- re- redeems that after there's repentance and dealing with the things that were wrong, and, and they get to occupy that land. So when you, this, I just want to say this, if, if compromise was part of uh, the sh- surrender of some borders in your life, God can restore them back. If you, have a, if you repent and you pr- decide to proceed God's way, yes. right? Yes. So that's a big thing. Yes. But there are some things in our lives that we don't have. 
and you're not, maybe not going to like this. I'm going to tell you the truth. There are some things that are promises to you and for you that you don't get to walk in because of some of the choices that you and I make. Yeah, right? What? It's not that God doesn't want that for you. It's just that you chose to not have that. It's your choice. And you know what he'll do? He'll say, hey, buddy, hey, buddy, uh, hey, let's make that adjustment because I really want you to have that. So he'll come again, and he'll come again, and he'll come again. And you know, that's called the conviction of the Holy Ghost. No, no, I didn't say the condemnation. This is the conviction. So maybe it's there's something you're doing, or, uh, or, or, or and I'm not just saying, okay, uh, smoking or drinking or looking at something you shouldn't, but like there are things that the Lord would convict you on and say, hey, hey. And if the conviction of the Holy Ghost is there and you're unwilling to yield, well, uh, then, then you kind of are stuck. And you can't occupy any more of the promise until you pass that test. Uh, this weekend when I was gone, uh, or this week, um, I love uh, Brother Marvin Yoder. He was actually a teacher of ours at Ramah. He was the dean while, he, while I was there back in 2002 and 2003. Um, but... He, he talked about the plan of God for our lives and how um, God, he, he used this analogy of the plan of God being linear. In other words, that God doesn't, the gifts and callings of God for your and my life, they don't change. They are without repentance, the Bible says. In other words, if God called you to do something, uh, that's what he's going to say. So how did that go? <laughs> when, at one, one day, he's going to say, so how, how did that go? How, you know, you know, uh, did you, were you the baseball player you were supposed to be? No, those early practices, I didn't want to get up at, you know, or whatever it might be, because there's a baseball player. Everything's not a uh, five-fold ministry, right? Some, some things are like the call of God on your life was, uh, hey, so uh, did you have that great influence as a plumber? Uh, no, because that would have required me taking a step of faith to step out and on my own into business, but I was a little afraid. And every time he said, you nudge me in the services or when you had a friend give me uh, uh, another, you know, like another word that was a confirming word, it was like, oh, I don't know about that because my dad fell here and I'm what I consider. And so you get to take that test again. But anyway, he talked about the plans of God as linear. And he, he said, uh, he, he used this analogy where like you're making your way along on the plan of God. And, uh, and, and, and you hit this spot where the Lord's talking to you. And at that spot or at that junction, you're just like, yeah, I don't know about that. And so what the Lord does is he leads you back to that spot. <laughs> so you can make that choice again. And that choice, you I don't really know about that. <laughs> and you get to come back. And you ever, you ever got caught in the circles of life? You ever, maybe, maybe, maybe not you. Maybe you've seen somebody stuck going around the same thing. Maybe you're stuck in this thing uh, of, of depression. And, the, okay, depression is spiritual. It's not just a, a natural symptom, a physical, chemical imbalance, okay? There is a, a, a very much spiritual and, and you, could, you could say that because everything in my body yields to the Word of God. Everything you and I see yields to the Word of God. And words are spirit. So everything we're talking about really is spiritual. But, but you and I, maybe in the, in the moment of, because sometimes it does, if you've ever had to battle some of that, um, it does feel good. It, it, it actually hurts. I don't know. It stinks, sucks, whatever you want to say. Like just it's a horrible pit. But yet, in the pit, it does feel good to say, my precious. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like when you're in the pit, it's the worst place to be. I ha you hate it, I hate it, it's the worst. But while you're in the pit, my precious, you still want to pet your flesh. You still want to make yourself feel good and think about all the, you know, and the Lord will come to you in the pit. Thank you, Lord. And you know what? You might reject the word that he brings to you in the pit. Guess what he's going to do? Bring it, again. Bring it again. 
He's going to bring it again. And, you, and when that word comes, that word has the power to pull you and I out of the pit or pull you and I out of the addiction or pull you and I out uh, or, or to make the decision to, to, to step out in faith or whatever it might be. In a sense, pass the test and go on in the plan of God for your life yeah. instead of being caught in the circles. And, and so... But in order to do that, you and I are going to have to win the battles at those junctions. That's what's going on uh, so many times is there's a battle going on. For destinies, there's a battle going on for, for, for the borders to which you and I occupy and really that our lives testify from. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4. So it says this, so though we live in this world, we do not wage war as this world does. For the weapons that we fight with um, are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they are mighty, uh, or they have de- and they have divine power to de- demolish strongholds, to demolish the places of the enemy. Well, the weapons that we fight with, let's establish this very clearly. Again, we're not wrestling naturally, according to Ephesians. It's a spiritual warfare. And the words, the, w- the way that we wrestle, the way that we fight, we fight with the word of God. Yeah. This is how we fight. And if we're going to do spirit, if we're going to occupy until he comes, if you and I let up occupying in our family, the enemy, he likes to be like this. If, as a pastor, if you don't occupy the place of prayer in, in a congregate over the, pl- the place the Lord has set, set you, you'll see that things, like, happen. <laughs> Not necessarily for the good. Now, everyone has a choice. Don't get me wrong. Your kids have a choice. You can be praying for your kids and all of that. Kind of, they still have a choice, absolutely. Choice is powerful. But, but the enemy, he, just gets, he kind of gets a little bit more of a stronghold to work from. I don't want the enemy to be able to work from the inside out. You know what I'm saying? The stronghold. I don't, I don't, I don't want that in my house. I don't want that in your house. Um, I, I want him outside my borders. I want him to be outside my borders. Yeah, there might, there'll be attacks, but, but, but that's my place. That's my place to fight from, not his place to fight from. He, doesn't, he, doesn't, he should not have a stronghold there. He shouldn't be able to occupy a place that God has given me through promise. That's my place. But when symptoms come on, just my back hurts. I'm just feeling so sick today. Like, how much longer is this going to hold on? It's like, God, this is terrible. This is, oh, golly, what in the world? Oh, it's probably like, last, they had it like for seven days. Maybe I, just let them, what, what's, what does the fight of faith look like? Oh, I, I, this is, this is, this is, oh, I'm only talking to me tonight, though, no. okay? Um, because there are promises given to you and me, and there is a fight of faith that we are to fight. If we're going to occupy, oh, yeah, you got a headache? Oh, yeah, I just need some ibuprofen. Yeah, that's great. I'm not down in ibuprofen, if that, but I'm asking you about what borders do you want to occupy that the Lord has given you? Yeah. See, part of bringing a good report and stewarding well is stewarding what the Lord has given you. We, we talk about the parable of the talents all the time, but do we ever wonder, could there be some talents that we don't know about? Like, that, that are in his word, they're called promises. We, I think we think talents are more just like, oh, I can hit a baseball, or I'm good at cooking, or I can really sing. Those are my talents. No, talents are things of value that, that the master gave to his people and he left. And some of the talents that you and I have been given are promise or promises. That you and I are to be stewarding and to be holding and to passing on and in a sense that our family would own that. Your family should have, look, Lord, you gave me five. Look, we got ten. Look, at we're just, we walk in this 
there's families that walk in some of the promises of God, and it's just like that family, they just, they just walk in that. They, you just know that they're going to have that. Anyway, let's keep going here. So uh, Paul tells Timothy, and, and he's talking, uh, to, talking about really the expansion of the gospel. And so uh, that's what I'm talking about tonight, the expansion of the gospel. And he tells Timothy how he should live. And how he should live in a way that is uh, occupying and or living as if the word of God is true. He says, Paul, uh, Paul says, Timothy, there's been a lot of guys. This is, this is it's found in 1 Timothy chapter 6. But at the beginning of, uh, of chapter 6, he's like, this is just Nate's modern day paraphrase. Tim, there's been a lot of guys that have come and preached the word. And they're not, they're not living uh, according to the word. Matter of fact, uh, they're, they're kind of going off the deep end over here. They're allowing these kind of things in. They're, he says, hey, here's what I need you to do. And, I, and I go on, he goes on to tell them, fight the good fight of faith. And he says, I need you to keep this command. I need you to occupy and, in a sense, hold your ground uh, until the Lord's return. That you would, you would say, this is what God did. This is what he said. This is, the, this is the gospel that we preach. And you hold to that gospel. Hold to the good news. Oh, I know there's going to be pressure to, to, that's going to push against here. But what does the word say? What did the word say? Compromise will say, well, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, complaining and doubt will go, ah, it, it'll, it'll cause our borders to shrink. It'll, let me say it this way. It'll cause our influence to shrink. You know, it's amazing how uh, these, the, you don't really see when you, when you look at land, or not land, but when you look at the Olympics, okay? You see these big nations, they're the, one, they're, they're the ones that have the, the medals, the influence, the, the, not, not always, but you're seeing, when you see the, the big, more influence. Walmart, they could decide to do something, and guess what they're going to have? Influence. Probably more than the mom and pop shop down the road. Why? Because of their size. There are, there, we're to be occupying, and we're to occupy the fullness of, of the gospel, and when you and I hold the fullness of the gospel and, and the good news like he, Jesus, preached it from the beginning, then you know what we have? We have influence. But the moment we compromise and the moment we are, are in a place of doubt and, and walking back and say, I don't know, we, we, we recede and we take that light in that bushel and we go like this. And then we, 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 we resort to just ultimately preaching Jesus as just, well, we're going to tell the message of salvation instead of even what it looks like when you're out and about, when we are, as a church are serving our generation, giving, giving of a supply of good news, going about doing good. It, this is what Jesus, going about doing good and healing all. You're like, okay, that, yeah, but we have to get our borders back. There are some things that we have to get back. And, and it would be good for us to, in a sense, go back and, and, and open up the boundaries, which we're going to look at next week. We're going to look at some boundary lines that God has given us through the gospel. Some boundary lines that are like, you know what, this is, God, this it says it, you know, uh, it says it right here. Yeah, that, that is mine. Okay, you know what, when I see that, when I see that they, they're, he's coming in this area over here, I'm going to say, hey, uh uh right here. I'm going to use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, to occupy that place. You can bind up and cast whatever you want out and allow him to come in over here, all, the, you, all that you want. Like If you're not going to hold to what the Word of God says, you can say, uh, get out, but I'm going to go ahead and continue to let you in. Okay, I'll give you an example. You got maybe your family zeal maybe with, uh, I don't know, maybe some spirit of junk in your house, like fear. And you're deciding to sit down when the kids go to bed and watch Freddy Cougar. You don't know what that is, okay. Uh, Halloween. Um, Chucky. Oh, the horror movies, don't, the gremlins. I know I'm dating myself a little bit with these horror movies. Yeah, Lifetime. Jason, right? Friday the 13th. 
Uh, but hey, you know, my the kids are dealing with fear, you know, and the fears in my house, and it's not just not being able to sleep at night, it's fear of man, it's fear, it just filters down. It's fear to make the decisions, it's fear to sing in front of the, the it's fear to, it, it's, it, it's just fear. And I think we gotta, we gotta kind of eradicate, uh, the righteous are as bold as a lion, so if my kids are filled with fear, hmm, wonder, wonder how, why, why that's allowed in my house. Why is fear allowed in my house? Why, why is fear allowed? Why do my kids, why do my kids, and I'm not saying that you can't come and snuggle with them at night if there's a thunderstorm or whatever, but why do my kids, every time they hear anything, come running to me and say, oh, daddy, 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 when... Is there, is, there, is there fear present? Because if fear is present, I need to address fear in that moment so that it doesn't, it, doesn't ha- it doesn't creep in and occupy the space of my home when the Lord has given me not a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. And that sound mind, now when they hear the sound, their mind doesn't go, oh my gosh, a tornado's going to crush me. And I'm going to die. And really it was the garbage disposal. Instead, they're like, thank you, Lord. You are my shepherd and my strength and my shield. Wow. Peace of mind. Occupying. Thwarting the enemy. Standing as a beacon of light in a world full of fear. Peace, hope, strength. If I'm tagging you and you don't like it, then that's evidence right there that that's in your house and you don't, you're taking that personal as an assault from me. It's not an assault from me. That's right. You are being assaulted by the enemy. Right. And it's up to you and me to get that cut out. Right. I don't even know how that example popped up. It's not in any of these notes. But he says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of, the, of eternal life, which you recall. This is 1 Timothy 6, 12. When you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I love this uh, in 1 Timothy 1, uh, 18. He says, This charge I commit unto my son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before thee, that by, by them you might wage a good warfare. Did you know there's prophecies that went before him? There's prophecies that went before you. And it's not just, oh, um, Landon, you are called of the Lord to do this because somebody said it to you. Can I tell you that the, this right here is a prophecy that has declared God's will for you and his hope for you and the strength for you and your family that has went before you. And before you were born, he knew you and he formed you and he prepared good things for you to walk in. And it's right here. And they went before you. So get those back out. Those prophecies that are there to strengthen you, to encourage you, and to show you what's to come, to make those adjustments. This is why the word of the Lord came. That's a prophecy. It's the word of the Lord. So get that out so that you can wage a good warfare. A good warfare is one where you and I expand our borders. Listen, buddy, if I'm going to war and I'm having to spend some of my time, I'm taking some of your stuff. That's the truth. I'm taking some of you. You shouldn't have been jacking with me. Like, you ever hear the scripture? Took back what he stole from me. I went to the enemy's camp. You ever heard that song? And they took back? Yep. Yeah, why? Because he's under my feet. He's under my feet. There's, that's how this song, this song goes, but that's scripture. Yeah. He's under who, your feet. Who's under your feet? The one that steals, the one that kills, the, the one that destroys, the thief. If you see those fingerprints in your home, you need to rise up and you need to take your place of authority and you need to battle Instead of allowing that to remain, if you see the enemy stealing, killing, and destroying in any capacity in a place that the Lord has given you authority, whether it's your church, whether it's your home, whether it's your business, you say, no devil, you're not welcome here. I bind you up in the name of Jesus. I cast you out, and you're not operating here anymore. You're saying, this is the the word of God, and you put the word of God 
a promise of God. You said that I would be blessed coming and going and that you would rebuke the devourer for my sake. According to Malachi chapter 3, you said that bring your tithes to the storehouse and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out upon you a blessing that there's not room enough to receive. Lord, I thank you that I'm not limited only to my job. I'm, my, my limit is only the resources of heaven. Now let's keep going here. So he says this, get those back out. I don't even know what time it is. What time is it? 7.45. What time is it? What time are we supposed to be done? It's 6.30. We're done. We're, we're supposed to be done. So um, that's right. We are supposed to be done. I, I'm back on the old, old uh, time. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. No. Eight? Oh, we got 15 minutes all day. Let's go. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, there are promises of the Lord that, uh, that are given to us, but you know what? Sometimes it's just easy. Uh, maybe we just never knew about them. So There's a lot of times that we just don't know. And the Lord says that, that my people are destroyed because of what they don't know. So this is why it's so vital to have teachers and to be teachable. Like, that's huge, right? To have a teacher and to be teachable. God gave us teachers. Aren't you thankful that somebody taught you how to do math? Otherwise, you would have been lost trying to figure it out. Or how to read and how to make a sound. and you know, Or how about just somebody that would, just as uh, somebody taught Apollos the word of God more accurately. Like here's this man sharing the gospel, and here comes Aquila and Priscilla, and they, they bring him, Apollos, which is another apostle that was just like Paul, but in a different region, and they brought him into a place, and they taught him the word of God more accurately. You know how thankful Apollos must have been? Do you know how thankful those after him would be, not even knowing how, because they were taught more accurately or more completely? So, so teachers, so look at this. In Psalms 103, uh, 2 through 3, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. I love this. Who, I love this. Forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, and who heals all your diseases. Now, <clears throat> uh, let's put that back up there. Forgives all of your sins. Now, this is, a, this is a big verse that's not just about healing of diseases. This is about anything. The Bible says that, that when sin entered, death entered. Anything that has the fingerprints of death entered, that there are promises. Go back to the verse right before, verse 2. It says, there are benefits that are yours and mine because of the blood of Jesus. There are benefits. And, and you know, um, your mom or grandma or great-great-grandma, she could have passed away and left you some benefits. You, there, there could be somebody here right now that has a bank note a trust, a bond from way, way back. You just don't know about it. it very, very, there's a very real possibility. Matter of fact, uh, I think it was Courtney's mom who loved looking at, uh, like in the paper and finding, you know, like people would have money and, 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 and they'd have to post it. Like these people have money, but no, they don't know where they're at. And there it is, it was posted. And if they don't claim it, then... Anyway, Interesting. Interesting. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. I just want to take a, take a moment uh, there tonight. Ephesians is, is, is a beautiful book um, <clears throat> written to the church. Again, these are the epistles, right? Epistles? Epistles? No. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and I want to just, I want to hit just a couple of verses that really put to you and me the things of heaven here on earth, Okay. It's really important that we understand this. And this is, these are the, the, this is Paul explaining the mystery uh, of, of Christ and the church to the Gentiles, which was not explained to the Jews. Because in order for that to be explained to the Jews, the Jews would have had to receive Jesus as the Messiah. So there is a lot they're, they're still waiting on to see. So the fullness in the New Testament, the new covenant that Jesus made, Paul is explaining to anyone who would receive it. He, he, he's explaining it to those when Jesus said, now go to the highways and the byways and the hedges. Go to the, 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 those roads. He said, I want my house full. 
He said, go to anyone who would say they, they recognize they are without hope. They're not the invited chosen ones. And invite them in and say, I'm choosing you to come in. And, and he's saying, this is the New Testament. This is the new covenant that I'm making with you. This is the good news that I have for you, the, that you were once lost, but now that you, um, you're now found. And I, and, and I reached out to you, and I'm going to be good for you. And for ages to come, this is now I'm jumping to Ephesians 2 already, but I'm gonna, you, uh, you're going to be a testimony. You're going to testify. You're going to be uh, an example of my goodness and my love. The people are like, wow. Okay, so here we are. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. How are we blessed? Okay, so is it, am I blessed only according to my works? No, I'm blessed. The blessings are available to me, anyone in Christ. Anyone in Christ, these blessings are available. Uh, in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Every one, every blessing, every spiritual blessing. In what places? Uh, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly. So there are blessings, just right here. Available for right here. This is, I'm not trying to get radical here. Let's just take, take a moment and just kind of cruise through some of Scripture and look at even, even in the epistle, or not the epistles, but in the Gospels where, where Jesus pulled some fish from. I don't know. They filled a net. I don't know, there was a coin somehow that jumped into a fish's mouth. There was some loaves and some fishes that filled a bunch of bellies. I, 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 I don't know, but somehow, like, Philip was, like, here, and then he was there, and then he wasn't there. You know, he was with, and he baptized somebody in water so that he dunked him and picked him up, so there must have not just been a ghost, you know, like he would have been, you know. like there, So the, what I'm saying is, when Jesus, he, he walked through walls, you can't, but yet you could, like, it's just, there's just a lot of interesting things that you and I were like, we're, we're so too much like. That's what's real right there. I can touch it, I can feel it, I can see it. But boy, there's a whole lot more that's real and available than what you can see or taste, or feel, and your heart, which you can't see, will bear witness and testify to you of it. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. So he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in, he in heavenly realms. He's blessed us with all these things, all right? Let's jump down uh, to verse 7. It says this. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us with all wisdom and understanding. And he has made known to us, I'm, I'm just reading through here, and he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to bring all things, uh, let's see what it says in this, this translation, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together in Christ. What does it say here? That he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both that which are in heaven and which are here on earth. Uh, there are things that you that are in heaven. I'm just making this making this clear tonight. There are things that God has for you that are laid up, and there are things, and He would love, He wants to bring them together even here with the things on earth, like. You, your and my uh, possibilities, again, I'm bringing up the movie of the hill last night when I'm watching this movie, and I'm like, that's available. Come on. Just... That's what I'm thinking. Like, it's going to happen. It's part of the movie. It's coming. It's coming. Why? Because I reason that that is a border given to the righteous because these people are in Christ. It's going to happen. Come on. Like, that's what I'm reasoning. What are you, where's, my, where's our reason? I'm not saying, oh, Pat made on the back. No, I'm, I'm just saying like that's, like you just, like you know that's a, not a, that's a promise. Yeah. It's not only a possibility, right. it's a promise. Right. With God, all things are possible, absolutely. But when God has promised, it's yes and so be it. Right. Or it is so. 
When I say amen, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying it's so. It's done. In Jesus' name, it's done. In Jesus' name, it's done. That's what I'm saying. Okay, and so he goes on, and, and, and so let's keep reading here. So he brings those together in Christ. How, how do they come together? In Christ. The, he gives it to us in Christ. This is the good news of the gospel. These things are made available to us in Christ. This is where, in Luke chapter 4, when you read about this, Jesus saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the good news, to set captives free, to, to restore some things. This is the gospel. I don't know that we hear this enough, and we just get distracted by the things of this life, and the enemy comes in, and he kind of crowds our borders. And as long as we don't recognize him, like we can lay down at night a little bit, and you know, we can kind of occupy this place until he comes, instead of this place until he comes. But people are suffering because of compromise. As I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about this compromise and, and, and how there was a Missouri compromise, and the next day, the people of the South, they appealed that compromise, the, where basically, I'm thinking, these dudes in Washington, okay, they are making some agreements at a table and, there are, and, and then they have the numbers of the amount of slaves, okay, that are in the nation that it will affect. Like, compromise, their compromise, they're willing to make a deal, hey, you know, a little deal. And while they're making a deal, they throw in another deal that Maine will become a state as well. Well, if we're going to do this, let's make sure Maine becomes a state as well. So that gets added in. And so, you know, this is how things in these bills get passed today. We'll make sure we get that bridge over there. And this guy over here, he needs a little of that. So throw that in there and the bills get this long. But they're making these, these deals. And while they're making these deals and they're compromising on what their standards would be because, well, this would be, the, you know, compromise a little bit. There are so many people whose destinies hang in the balance. I was like seeing that. I'm like, what if Martha, I don't know what her name would have been, Peter, Nathan, Isaiah, all who are African American, what if their lives were set free in 1820? Instead of after the Civil War in 1863 or eight, eight, when the Emancipation of Proclamation or 1864, one of those two, it, it was signed in. The war ended in 65, but the, the, I think it was 63 when it was signed. What if? What if somebody didn't compromise and they said no? What if it was something else was fought for a little bit more, even though there was pressure, even though political pressure was there, even though what if somebody stood up and, you know, what if? I just was thinking about what about these thousands of lives? And, and I just saw that. I saw how, how that translated to Christians. Because you too once walked as slaves, blinded, governed. It actually says this in Ephesians 2. In times past, but, but someone came and found you. Someone rescued you. Someone, someone brought the good news of Jesus Christ to you. I'm thinking like, wow. I wonder what it would look like if, we, if I wasn't so easy to compromise on the promises of God. That I really did own that border. And I would say, hey. And I, I, I put myself in this, um, in this time like, what would I have done? Like the underground world, what would I have done in World War II with the Jewish people? My house, uh, how many holes would I have had? And back doors would I have had? If I was uh, uh, in the States, uh, where, where would I, how many slaves would I have had? And I would have bought them. How many would I have bought? And they would be about buying more. We would go buy more. Like, I mean, this is my, and we would have land just across the border. And, and like, it, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've put myself in that place. What could I do? What could we do to rescue someone? Well, like, I was thinking about preaching Jesus. 
and have it being more than a message. But if I don't, where am I going to bring somebody? People all over the world are trying to come to the land of the free and the home of the brave. But if the church isn't truly the land of the free, where are we going to bring them? What are, you, what, are we, we're gonna, what are we bringing them? Just like some theology? Like, I don't want to hear about Jesus. Well, uh, <laughs> change the... Rock their world. Bring a gift of the Spirit to them where they can receive it. You know, the gift of the Spirit is help, the helper. That, that you, got, you brought something from, that was made available to you, the things in this realm, to this realm, so that you could declare to them the good news. So these things matter. The borders, the borders that we hold, are not. Are, they're actually borders of our minds. Go here. This is how he works, and this is how he fights. And there's strongholds in our minds. There's places that he. And this is why it's so important for you and I to place ourselves before the Word and be not conformed to this world. Do not let the pressure. Bring you and I in to now hold a border that is so much less than what Jesus declared and established from the beginning. But be transformed. But be, push out. Push out. Can you imagine like the butterfly in the cocoon? Push out. Push back against. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's a pushing back, a changing of within, but also a pushing out of that which once held us. Thank you, Lord. And he says this in, the, in Romans chapter 12. He says, in view of the mercy, I beg of you, in view of the mercies of God, I beg of you, in view. He actually, the way that that's written in he, or Romans chapter 12, 1, he actually, it's written like this. On his knees, Paul is, please, in, in, he's begging them. I beseech you, brethren. I beg you. I, 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 there's no more emphatic way to write this letter than say, because of all of God's kindness and his mercies, forget, because of all of his benefits, I, 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 want, I want you to be aware of this, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, like that you're willing to, to lay yourself down, to lay your own way down, your own will down, and, and let what God said open the word of God. Let the Holy Spirit teach you that you and I would say, that's mine. Okay. I don't know about that. I don't know, but that's what that says. I haven't experienced that. I haven't seen that, but that's what that says. Okay, Lord, show me. Show me more. Show me more. I'll be teachable. And you'll find that things will change. Anyway, I want to close. Um, golly. Oh, thank you, Lord. So um, brought together in Christ, verse 10. Uh, we'll jump down to verse uh, 20. Or verse 19, and, this, uh, and he, the, he gave this to us. No, no, let's go to verse 18. And I ask that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you know the hope of his calling. Again, where you're to be looking and what you're to be looking with is the eyes of your heart. That you would know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and the surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of his mighty strength which he demonstrated or he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and he seated him at his right hand in heavenly realms. He seated him far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in the present age, but also in the one that is to come. And he put everything under his feet. And he made him the head over everything for the church. When I'm talking about battling and I'm talking about borders and I'm talking about occupying and taking authority over and occupying the place of promise. We have to re just establish and understand that we don't wrestle for victory. We wrestle from a place that's far above. We have authority in Christ. We are the body of Christ. He is the head. We as the church, we have to see ourselves not down here but above and, and, and get that picture in us and I'm jumping down to verse 4 because of his great love for us 
God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead. It is by grace we've been saved. And God raised us up. And he seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. All the way down to verse 12. And remember that at time once you were separate, aliens, separated from Christ, from the commonwealth, strangers of covenant, of promise, without hope, without God in this world. But now in Christ, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He's saying, remember what has been given to you. Remember how this is so important if we're going to occupy in this place. we got to remember what's given to us. But in that place of seeing and knowing what we have, uh, silver and gold I have none, but what I do have, I'll give to you. What I do have. I don't, I can't give what I'm not aware that I hold. Uh, There's so many times that it's happened where it's like, God, man, I wish I had something I could bless that guy with. And, and, and you might go to your truck and you're like, oh, I had that right there. I forgot that I had set that in that back. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, First, Second Peter 1, I'll close with this. Grace and peace be yours. Second Peter 1, verse 2. Uh, no, I'm going to read the verse 1. To those who, through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received faith as precious as ours. It's an important part. To you who've received Jesus, he says, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace is yours in abundance. You know what you can do when you have an abundance of grace and peace? wholeness, completeness in Christ that we just talked about all these things, you can give it away. You can give, you can give it away. Oh, I'm in a battle, brother. I'm in a battle. No, I I need to occupy. I need to take authority over, not fight for victory, but I take from here and I occupy the place and with the grace and peace being multiplied to me. It, while my head is hurting and I got the runs. Thank you, Lord. Your spirit's strong in me. I'll give you praise in this. In this, Lord, thank you that you're at work right now, even working at healing in my body. Father, thank you that you said that by your stripes I'm healed. That my, my response is not one of complaining. My response is not one of compromise. Instead, my response is one of saying, you know what, this is given to me. This is my border. And this is mine. Lord, thank you that by your stripes I was healed. That you heal all of my diseases. Thank you. And I stay in that place of occupying. And I'll tell you what, you, you'll find that if you'll occupy that place, you will, you will establish that border. I mean, just, you're not going to, that was a sumo wrestler move. You're not going to be moved. You're not going to be moved. There are some places that we have to get back. You know, there's some places, there's some places that, you once held that you don't hold anymore. Is this true? Could there be a place of promise that I held in infancy as a babe in Christ that my experience and history and offenses has caused me to recede on? The Lord's like, there's a war going on, Nate. There's a war going on in every home. There's a war going on in every business. There's a war going on. And it's for what I said and what I purchased through my son Jesus. There's a war going on. Well, can we occupy? Can we push back some borders? 
Can we take a stand? Can we put the word of God in our mouth whenever we see something instead of just be silent? Can we say what God says? Can we take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God? Ephesians chapter 6. Can we do that? Tell me about the fight of faith. What are you fighting right now with faith? Because if you're not fighting, you're not occupying. If you're not occupying, your borders are shrinking and they're supposed to be expanding. The influence of the church is supposed to be expanding because God wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth and salvation. Like He wants all to experience Him. And not just the way that is like this churchy way to tell somebody about Christ but to bring them Christ the good news and that right there is the calling card if you and I will have our borders if we truly are operating from the home of the brave the land of the free so to speak spiritually I'm telling you what immigrants slaves new life swept in the kingdom of God guys If two agree on earth as touching anything, it'll be done for them. There's a promise. At work, anybody telling you about a story? Anybody telling you about some heartache? In that moment of heartache, what do we do? You having a bad day? You having a bad week? Having a bad year? They haven't? Okay, well, what are we going to do? You want to just leave them in that state? can or you can preach the gospel we can agree and bring just get a, get back a hold of this scripture if two agree is touching anything here on earth well I don't know if they're in agreement I don't know okay then the prayer of faith <laughs> can be prayed and it'll heal the sick like I don't let's not go to compromise let's say this is the standard and let's not move from it Otherwise, the enemy can just take over. Anyway, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, if you wanted to keep on reading, some good home reading, it'd be finished all the way through verse 9. How his divine power has given us everything that we need for our godly life through him, knowledge of him who has called us out of his glory and goodness. Through these, he gave us some exceeding great, very precious promises so that through them, you may participate in his divine nature. Did you know that? God wants us to be participating in a divine nature, a heavenly, the things of heaven here on earth. He wants us to participate, having escaped a corruption in this world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control. He's talking about operating in perseverance, like talking about you and I not being moved off of the promises of God. Add to what you know. Add to what you don't. Oh, that border's mine too. Add to the not quit. Add to the not quit. Add to your character, the the things of God. Look more like Him, and and people will come for what you carry, which is the very Spirit of God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Ah, thank you, Lord. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting what they've been cleansed. Look at that. Isn't that interesting? When you don't, he said, you forgot. You just don't know. Like that's the last verse 9. He said, you forget. You you and I, we can forget of the places that we hold, of the things that were given to us. Maybe, Maybe we forget. Maybe we never heard. Maybe we didn't know. Maybe this bold message is resonating with your hearts tonight. The same way it's resonated with me, the Lord saying, hey, stand up. Fight. When you when you don't fight, you'll recognize warfare. It just seems like it increases. But if you'll stand up and just let the word of God come out of your mouth. Like, let's just let the word of God come out of your mouth. You got a promise? You got, a, you got something that, that you're fighting right now? What's, your, what's the word? What are you fighting? What does God say about it? Let's stand. 
going to have to do less talking about and more talking to. Talk right to it. Speak to it. In the name of Jesus. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you that you're doing a work uh, in your people, that you're doing a work uh, in this place. You're doing a work in this city. You're doing a work in our homes. We thank you that he, even right now we, we come into agreement when we said, uh, you said, here's how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I thank you that there would just be a, 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 just a radical move in our hearts tonight that would be the standard of here on earth as it is in heaven for our homes. Uh, that that, that heaven's, uh, heaven's realities would be uh, earthly realities to us. That we would know that there's access that in, in Christ, the things, all the blessings in the spiritual realm have been made available to us in you. Uh, Father, thank you for that. Just a radical change in our hearts. If that's you and you're just saying, Lord, I want that radical change in my heart tonight to see your promises and your word. Just lift the, your hands to the Lord tonight. And Father, thank you tonight for your word being just truth to us. And so freedom would be the result. Freedom uh, just in, in just so many areas. And that we would be the occupiers until you come. We wouldn't be occupied. We would occupy. Oh, Father, thank you for, for that, that this is an occupying church. Father, thank you that, that the, the, the message of the good news of your son Jesus and the fullness and the completeness of his work is, is even imparted uh, and we're taught of you. Holy Spirit, be the teacher in this place. Every time we gather, every time we come together, teach us. Show us who you are. To be a witness. To testify. Of your goodness. Of your glory. Your kindness. And your mercies. Here on this earth. Thank you for the ministry given to each and every person here. The ministry of reconciliation. To reconcile people back to you, Lord. I just, we just say that. I'm a minister. I'm a minister. I'm a servant of the Lord Most High. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys tonight. I, I just really believe this is a, was a word for, it was for me, but it was for us. Like, there's a time to occupy. Amen. Amen. And it's now. Amen. So put the word in your mouth and fight from where you're at. Amen. You're dismissed.